Hey, what's good, everybody? At MuCon 2020, I'm very, very honored to be a keynote speaker this year uh, at this prestigious conference for the music industry in Asia and worldwide. My name is Jason Ma. I thought I'd just start off by telling you a little bit about my journey into the music business and the music industry and music and the crossroad of technology and music. So I grew up in the Bay Area and I actually got my first start uh, in the startup scene in venture capital. And so I was actually working at a tech startup in San Jose across from Apple Computer in a city called Cupertino, uh, making websites for small and medium sized businesses. Uh, around that time, I was running an inner city hip hop Bible study uh, in San Jose to get at risk kids off the streets. I know it sounds crazy, uh, but on Sunday nights, there was a legendary hip hop rapper that some of you that are millennial and older may know. His name was MC Hammer. And if you guys don't know who MC Hammer is, you can't touch this, too legit to quit. First rapper to take hip hop pop and go double diamond. And he was preaching out of church. And I actually went to go listen to him every Sunday night, MC Hammer actually doing a Bible study. And so fast forward, I actually met him got him to come speak at my little inner city hip hop outreach. And when I met him and pitched him, he asked me, you know, what do you do? I guess he understood that he could tell I was like a young hustler or something like that. And he was like, what do you do? I was like, well, I work at the startup. And he was like, well, I invest in startups. I, I'm a venture capitalist. And I said, okay. And he said, so you're Asian. You must have to use computers. Why don't you come work for me? And I was just like, what? Working for MC Hammer, right? And I was tripping out. And, and the reason why I share the story was at the age of 17, I got a firsthand look uh, with MC Hammer into the ecosystem of what we now know as Silicon Valley. And back then, he brought me to the ground floor of YouTube when it was five people above the pizza parlor in San Mateo, uh, Twitter when it was less than 10 people, Salesforce when it was less than 10 people, Google, Facebook. So we saw it all because uh, he was one of the first celebrities to actually invest in startups. And not a lot of people know this. He's a very accomplished venture capitalist today. But what he told me back then in 1997, 1998, this is 20 plus years ago, was he said, Jason, Hollywood's going down. Music industry's going down. Film industry's going down. Everything's about rich content, digital distribution, and everything's come to Silicon Valley. And at that time, I literally thought he was crazy. I was literally 17, 18 years old. Um, this is the time when like, you know, music videos from Britney Spears and you know, the Neptunes were at like a million dollars a music video. And we're talking about user generated content at that time. And lo and behold, 20 years later, now we see it. it all of Hollywood, all of the music industry is really controlled by technology companies, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google. And so the foresight of that was very, very interesting. And so around that time, we actually were at uh, CES uh, around the year 2000 and Hammer bumped into a young Asian American director. His name was Justin Lin. And if you know who Justin Lin is, Justin Lin is the director for the Fast and Furious franchise, part three, four, five, six, now nine and 10. And when Justin met Hammer, they were checking out high tech cameras in CES. And Justin was telling Hammer, I'm making my first independent Asian American film. It's called Better Luck Tomorrow. And I'm sick and tired of Asians being, you know, seen as goonies and geishas and geeks and gangsters, you know, in Hollywood film. I want to change that perception. And I'm making this true story about a true Asian gang murder in Orange County. And so he got Hammer's number, and about three months later, we were literally in the Bay Area, and Hammer gets a phone call. And it's basically Justin saying to him, I maxed out 10 credit cards, I borrowed all the money I can from my parents, and I literally cannot finish my film, and I need X amount of money in the bank tomorrow morning, or they're going to take away all my equipment, and it's game over. My movie's going to be done. And so Hammer just had a sixth sense, saw destiny in his eyes, and literally walked into the Bank, bank, bank of America, I believe, and just wired the cash. It was like nothing signed. It was, it was just completely blind faith. We didn't hear from Justin for over a year. And about a year later, I was in the office just online. And I literally see Sundance Film Festival, Roger Ebert gives two thumbs up to young Asian American director, Justin Lin, for this film, Better Luck Tomorrow at Sundance. I'm like, Hammer, is this the guy we invested in? And he was like, no way. Calls up Justin, freaks out. We go down to LA. And that was the first movie for John Cho, the Korean American actor we now know as Harold and Kumar in Soul Searching in Star Trek. The first movie for Sung Kang, who's a Korean American actor, who's in all the Fast and Furious franchises and dies and every other Fast and Furious comes back to life. Uh, Jason Tobin, who's in Cinemax Warrior. Uh, that's another production of J Justin Lin's recently. But my point with that was when I saw that movie, it changed my perception. And at that moment, I really believed that my life calling was to represent Asian culture in mainstream media the correct way, an authentic way, the right way. 
And so I went off and I, I ended up leaving venture capital. I actually did a four year missionary stint around the world uh, when I first actually went to Korea. And, and that was around the time when K-pop really started uh, blossoming, really started growing. I still remember when Girls' Generation came out with their first album with GGG. I still remember Big Bang when it was just starting to blow up. And around that time was when I invested around 2007 in my first uh, media music entertainment company. It was called Plan C Agency and Adventures.tv. And at that time, we had a few Asian American rappers and artists and singers that really knew, no one knew about. And we were just lucky. I, I guess time and, and luck and providence might have it, but uh, I invested in the company and we had a little rap group called Far East Movement. And I don't know if you've heard of Far East Movement, but you probably heard of their song, Like a G6, that ended up selling 15 million records, went number one as the first Asian American hip hop act ever in history on the Billboard charts that year. We also had a rapper named Jin. If you don't know who Jin is, he was 106 in Park, battle rap legend, beat every single rapper on BET seven Fridays in a row back in the early 2000s, got signed to DMX and Rough Riders. And then we ended up signing him at our company. And then he went to Hong Kong and Universal Hong Kong with a one album deal called ABC, American Born Chinese and blew up. And now he's one of the biggest rappers and hip hop artists of all time, but especially in mainland China. And then we also had a little half Filipino songwriter that we used to hire to come write and record for us because he needed the money. And I used to literally pay him 1500 bucks for four songs that he wrote and recorded for me. And his name was Bruno Mars. So that was kind of my first rendition from Hammer, all of a sudden to Far East Movement, Jin, seeing Bruno Mars, another Asian American hit number one on the Billboard charts. And I never could have imagined that could have happened. But if you really think about it, the way that it happened, it wasn't through analog, it was actually through digital. Like a G6 hit on YouTube, boom, millions of views in 72 hours. Same thing. When Bruno Mars hit, it was YouTube, it was digital, it was Twitter. Same thing when it hit Hong Kong with YouTube and then Weibo and WeChat, Aichi, Yoku in China. Fast forward, 2014 and 15, I started seeing a lot of digital media brands spring up on YouTube, like Vice, Box, uh, Tastemade. I began to see music channels like All Deaf Digital with Russell Simmons at the time, uh, uh, Me Too, uh, MITU, which is a Latin American uh, digital music channel, Maker Studios, Full Screen, and a lot of these other artists leveraging YouTube channels. And then when I was looking at China, I began to see what they call KOLs, Key Opinion Leaders, or Wang Hong, as they call it, starting to really gain traction in the China market. And so at that time, I was like, why isn't there an Asian digital music channel focused on music artists, focused on digital, focused on artists coming out of Asia? Because when I grew up in the summers in Hong Kong, I, I grew up in SF, and in the summers I would go to Hong Kong, I used to watch Channel V. I used to watch uh, MTV Asia, if you're of my generation. But back in 2015, that was legacy. No one was on cable anymore. And I was just like, why is that not an Asian digital music channel focused on music and Asian youth culture? And that's when I came up with the idea for 88 Rising. Uh, someone introduced me to a man named Ellen Debevoir. He had invested in Drama Fever, Machinima, uh, Me Too, All Dev Digital. And I said, hey, you've invested in African-American digital on YouTube channels. Uh, Latin American, what about Asia? What about Asia America? And he was like, you know what? You put together the plan, you put together the team, I'll write you the first check. And that's when uh, a good friend of mine, Justin Chan, uh, who's uh, the actor in Twilight, who's now in Korea and, and direct, directing some of the best films as of late, Gook, Miss Purple, et cetera, et cetera, introduced me uh, to my co-founder at 88 Rising, his name was Sean. And I remember at the time when we first met, the idea was kind of create like an MTV meets Vice for Asia. And so we came together and I raised the first two and a half million bucks uh, from venture capital because at the time I knew the major music labels, Sony, Warner, Universal, were not going to back Asian music artists from Asia to a U.S. market. It was just never going to happen, right? They would sign local artists for local, but they would never sign local Asian artists for global. So I was like, you know what? Forget that. I'm just going to take it into our own hands. We're going to raise our own venture capital. We're going to build our platform directly on social media channels, and we're going to pay for the best visual content, sign the best artists, and launch it ourselves and create a whole new platform. And so at that time when I was raising money, no one could understand, like, what do you mean East, West, digital music, Asia, artists? It doesn't make any sense. So when I went into these VC meetings, I still remember going to Spark Labs Global, which is one of our first investors in Idiot Rising. Shout out to Bernard Moon, Jimmy, uh, Frank and Jay and the whole team out there, Eugene, the whole team. But literally, I remember saying to them, have you guys ever heard of Vice? And they were like, yeah, Vice Media. I was like, what's the valuation of Vice? It's 2015. They're like, five billion plus. I said, well, we're the Asian Vice. We're Rice. And they were like, where do we sign? Where do we write the check, right? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm summarizing the story, but basically the parallel at that time 
was there was no Asian digital music landscape. And so we had to create a parallel. And of course, we were never going to call the company Rice, and it was called RYC in the first business plan. We ended up with 88 Rising. But the idea, again, was do it yourself, raise your own capital, sign your own artists, build your own content, and go direct to the consumer, right? You don't have to wait for a middleman. You don't have to wait for the hierarchy of, of the music label gods to see you and get a wind of you and sign you. And then that continued forward. And as I, as I ventured out of 88 Rising, now tens of millions of subscribers, multi-billion views, uh, I, I begin to realize, wow, music, content, video is getting more and more social. Around 2015, 16 is when I came across Musical.ly. And through a Goodwater Capital, uh, a, a venture capital firm focused on consumer tech uh, that I'm a partner with, a network partner with, uh, we did the Musical.ly investment. And at that time, when we got the Musical.ly investment, we're seeing a scale. We're seeing all these young tweens just making like music and to video. It's like a little karaoke machine on your phone. And it was so interactive, it was so innovative, it was so disruptive, and the numbers were scaling, but they didn't have any major celebrities on the platform just yet. And so I remember we were competing against some of the biggest Silicon Valley firms and Goodwater Capital. We were like a brand new firm on the block. And so it was very hard for us to get that allocation in Musical.ly because all the major firms from Sequoia to Greylock and Benchmark, all these types of big names were fighting for allocation. So I remember going to them and saying, hey, I'm going to give you Ariana Grande and I'm going to bring Ariana Grande onto the platform and she's going to start using Musical.ly. And if she does, you have to give us an allocation. And that's how we got the allocation, thankfully. But my point with that was once the celebrity, A-list, triple class A-list celebrity got on the platform, started posting, boom, Justin Bieber, Selena Gomez, Snoop, all these others started populating the platform until within 18 months, Musical.ly was acquired by ByteDance and now it's become TikTok. Uh, which then goes into how I got involved with Triller. So it's very interesting. A good friend of mine uh, introduced me to Mike Liu, the CEO of Triller, back around early 2018. And it was very interesting at the time. When I saw Triller, the product was very, very similar to Musical.ly, but it was a very uh, different demographic. It was mainly to black and brown communities, uh, uh, youth uh, uh, in America, hip hop, urban, progressive, you know, type of music and, and videos that were being made. And it was really dope. It was really cool. But it was very, very new. The DAU was still very small and it was just growing. So I told Mike, hey, I'd stay on uh, to advise and be a resource and be of help. But it was around 2019, around February, I remember Cardi B, you know, Chance the Rapper, DJ Khaled, Eminem, they just started posting thriller videos and no one was paying them. And I'm like, Mike, are we paying them? He's like, no, they're just doing it organically. So something happened where Triller had become so powerful as a cultural brand, right, within the black and brown community around hip hop, R&B, soul, and, and, and progressive music, DJ culture. And, and, and artists started posting, not because they had to or they were paid to, they did it because they loved the brand, they loved what it represent. They really believed that this was a platform for hip hop culture. And so when I started seeing that, I started reminiscing about what happened with Ariana Musical.ly, and I began to see Triller beginning to scale. So around that time, that's when I was actually in London, and I actually, uh, a funny story, met with my friend whose name's Lord Wei. Uh, he's the only Chinese lord in the House of Lords, like the, it's like the U.S. Congress, and he invited me there and, and for a tour, and we went to the tea room, and we went to the tea room. He actually bumped into three Brits uh, that happened to be music AI engineers, and they had a company called Mash Tracks, and they're like, Jason, this is my friend, you guys need to meet Jason. Jason Best is a music tech, yada, da, da, da. We connected and they're like, we have to show you our technology. I was like, I'm leaving tomorrow. They were like, just give me 30 minutes. Um, so I was speaking at a Founders Forum conference in London. We ended up meeting at a bar. They showed it to me for 30 minutes and it was the most amazing music AI technology that I have ever witnessed. And I've seen a lot where basically you can take any photo footage and any video footage, put it to any song, 100 different songs, and the AI will spit out a completely different music video short film premium cut edited originally to each unique song that you put the AI to. And so I said, what are you guys doing with this? They said, we had an offer to be bought out by a major tech company, or we're gonna go raise $15 million. I said, I have a better idea. Why don't you guys come back with me to LA? You guys should merge with this company uh, that I work with called Triller, and, and we can become the next TikTok. And that's kind of what happened. So 2019, around October, it was announced, uh, Proxima Media, Ryan Kavanaugh, Bobby Sarn, and, and, the, and the whole team, Mike Liu, were able to put the music AI with Triller's brand. And as you've seen, it's blown up and has now become one of the top social music videos in the world. And, and so that, to me, is a little bit more of my music journey 
with music industry, music content, music artistry, but also music technology, which really brings us today into post-pandemic 2020. I mean, I don't think any of us would have expected anything as crazy as it's been in this new year, uh, probably the craziest, most unimaginable year in history. And it's been challenging, but I also say that it's in crisis is where creativity is born, right? Crisis creates creativity. Crisis creates opportunity. And crisis, a lot of times, transitions us or forces us to get out of the old and into the new. And so a lot of people are asking right now, you know, one of the subject matters is what's going to happen with live music concerts? Uh, music business or live touring has completely been shut down worldwide this year, very possibly next year as well, or not until late next year. It can actually be safe, and we don't even know whether it's going to be 1,000, 5,000, or if there ever be 100,000 Lollapalooza or Coachella ever again, given the, the situation we're in with COVID. But what's interesting is that we've now been forced to go from live, uh, live entertainment to what I call virtual entertainment. We went from live music festivals now to virtual music festivals. So we came up with the idea, me and the Trilla team, I'm just an investor, but the Trilla team was like, you know what, what we came up with, Cotrilla, which ended up becoming Trilla Fest. And so it was the first time in history we gathered over 120 artists over 72 hours straight and literally had them perform over three days completely online. And it was mostly pre-recorded. Everyone from Snoop Dogg to the Migos to Pitbull, I mean, you name it, Marshmello. And it was in history, like Guinness World Book of Record, the biggest virtual music festival ever. We had over 5 million unique visitors, okay? We had literally over, you know, tens of millions of views. But think about this. If you were thinking just Coachella two weekends maximum, you're talking about maybe a few hundred thousand in attendees. We had 5 million attendees for this virtual music festival online. That's the power of virtual, right? No longer do you have to go to a physical place to experience music and music artistry and performance that you love, but you can actually do it virtually. And of course, virtual probably never replace the physical experience, right? But at the same time, you can still have that touch point from fans, right, to their favorite artists. We did the same thing at 88 Rising. Uh, you saw Asia Rising, which was, again, number one trending on YouTube worldwide, number one trending on Twitter worldwide. And it was, it was, it was you know, over about a dozen plus artists from all over Asia, right, over like a four hour or so uh, live stream pre-recorded again. But again, it, it, it just totally broke the internet. And, and, and again, if you thought about it, 88 Rising was supposed to have its own stage at Coachella, but we ended up doing our own virtual music festival that ended up getting way more views and way more exposure right, than it ever would have just at a physical live streamed event. And you're seeing this trend happen more and more. Look at Travis Scott with Fortnite. And, and that was a super, super sick experience. And then my buddies at Wave VR, they partnered up with TikTok and they did the weekend in live VR. And that, if you saw that experience, that was like some Blade Runner, like 20, 50,000, you know what I'm saying? It was like some next, next, next. And I think that's where it's going is that we have to understand that in a post-pandemic world, this is not gonna be the last virus. This is not gonna be the last outbreak. This is not gonna be the last disruption or, or natural disaster or act of God. So we have to be prepared now as an industry to think a dual way of entertainment, right? Both physical and virtual. So I think we're gonna see more and more of that as we go forward. Secondly, I also believe that music industry in general has to be 100% digital now. If you're not thinking 100% digital, if you're somehow still thinking analog, and just radio and, and posters and billboards and, and shows, et cetera, et cetera, then this is not where the world is going. The world is going into a virtual world. We are now a new digital continent. Yes, there's North America. Yes, there's South America. Yes, there's Northern Southern Africa, Europe, uh, Asia, China, you know, Africa. But really, we are not planet Earth as we know it. We're a digital Earth. We're a digital planet. We're a digital continent. Anyone can touch, connect with anybody, anywhere, at any time with their mobile phone. That's how simple it is. I can connect with someone from the Philippines to Alaska, right? All the way to the Nordics, right? Strictly on Instagram DM, strictly on a WhatsApp or a WeChat or whatever that might be. So I really believe that where it's going is you're seeing music artists now doing live DJ sessions, live recording sessions. Versus is a big thing, as you've seen all these rappers from back in the day. I, I love Snoop Dogg versus DMX on, on versus live on IG. I mean, there's so many new ways to entertain that's still safe, 
uh, still viral, still reaches the end goal, music for the masses being consumed, right? But it's happening in a virtual digital way. So we have to think that way. Every single artist, every single festival now is going on Twitch Live, IG Live, TikTok, Triller Live. Think about it, even Mike Tyson, right? I mean, I'm, I'm super thankful. Like it was back in, I think it was like April or something like that. My friend Sophie Watts was a co-founder of STX Entertainment. She called me one day. I just remember it was loud as, 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 I, as, as, as like it was yesterday, but literally called me Saturday morning. It's like, Jason, I have Mike Tyson comeback fight. What do you want to do? You're the first person I'm calling. I'm like, give me an hour. I'll call you right back. Thankfully, we negotiated it and we're able to bring the Mike Tyson fight on Triller, November 28th, pay-per-view. Make sure you watch it. Proceeds are going to charity. And I, I, I'm not uh, at any way ashamed to promote it. And so, so, but again, think about this. The biggest comeback in heavyweight boxing history, Mike Tyson versus Roy Jones Jr., two of the greatest legends, are fighting live stream on Triller exclusively to a global audience where everyone, we're expecting millions to be downloading this pay-per-view, but it's on an app. It's on your mobile phone that you can connect then to your TV or wherever you are. But again, everything has to be digital. You have to think about the digital first before you think about the physical, right? So I think that is very, very important um, as we go forward, you know, into this new day and age. Now, a lot of people are also talking about another subject right now. It's like, is it better to just do it yourself, right? DIY, right? Do I really need a major label uh, if I can just go direct on, you know, TuneCore or CD Baby or I can work with indie you know, labels like Empire, you know what I'm saying? Or, 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 or any of these other uh, Q&A, you know, these are more and more what we're seeing is as long as you can produce your music and you can build your own fan base with social media and you can do direct distribution through these independent digital distributors, right, around the world that are whether in Asia or whether local or whether global, do I really need a music label or a major music label deal to get hurt? And my recommendation and my advice would be stay indie until you believe you need a major, right? Because no one has an excuse anymore. Anyone can make music on their laptop. People can make music on their phone. You can record on your phone, right? You can get a good enough mic for a few hundred bucks, get your logic, get your pro tools, and just start making music. No one has an excuse to say, I can't make music. I don't have the money to make the music. And I don't have access to produce great music. No. There's every beat out there on YouTube. There's every single song or, or resource that you need. So no one has an excuse when it comes to, can I make music and can the music get heard? Because the way it's really getting heard anyways is through social media. So as long as you're building your own content, you're building your own brand, you're building your own social media platform, you're building your own fan base, you gotta just give them the best. I mean, look at Mac Miller, look at you know uh, uh, some of the biggest chance to rapper, indie artists who are still not signed to a major label that have massive, massive, massive reach, right? So if you think about it, to me, is when you get to a certain level where you're like, you know what, but I do need major label backing is when you get to a point, okay, that you're like, whoa, wait a second here. Like, I just can't handle this is going bigger than I can imagine. And you, you recognize the resources of the major label that take you to that next level to be a superstar, whether that be marketing, you know what I'm saying, whether that be booking, whether that be touring, whether that be merch, whatever that might be. I do think there is a place for the major label still when the artist himself or herself believes that they need major music label backing to back their careers, to get them to superstardom level. But my main advice would be stay indie until you believe you need a major or just continue to stay indie because you can take all that power and all that control into your own hands. And there's nothing better than being your own boss and making the music that the way you want to do it instead of it having in the hands of someone else. And so that's just me being an entrepreneur to other entrepreneurs. I would say do it yourself. And I've seen some amazing artists on YouTube. I mean, I mean like tech nine, I mean, there's artists out there that are just doing their thing and, and they're blowing up and they're making music and they, they're taking the music and their destiny into their own hands and they're making millions of dollars and I'm nothing but props, respect, and excitement. At the same time, nothing but hats off respect to the major music labels because the major music labels are still doing incredible distribution, incredible marketing, and, and hands-on resources uh, that you know you can't get anywhere else in, in many ways, right? But I, I just really believe it's a choice for you to make as the artist. A lot of people have also been asking me, uh, you know, what is the difference with Triller with all the other social music video apps out there? As you know, there's dozens, you know, there's Likey, 
there's TikTok, there's Low Motive, you know what I'm saying? There's there's all these different social music video apps. What I can say about Triller is more than just, you know, a social video music app, we are a brand. You know, you know, we always say, do you, right? We are here to support the artists, support the labels. We're about the music industry. Some people have likened uh, uh, TikTok to America's Got Talent, and they'll say Triller's MTV, TRL, BET, right? And, I, and I'm actually down with that analogy because that really is what Triller is. We're the new MTV. We're the new BET. We are the new music channel for everyone and anyone to make the best music and music visuals and videos and entertainment than any other platform. We truly believe that. What makes us different, though, than TikTok, I really say sometimes at the office we have, you know, a, a little poster that says TikTok is for kids because that really is the demographic is mainly tweens for TikTok, whereas Triller, it's a little bit of an older demographic and a little bit more mature and, 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 and the content that you see uh, when you open up the Triller app, you'll just see a lot more, I would just say, cooler content. I really believe that. It's, it's creative. It's cooler. It's not just like, you know, memes and, you know, little, little, <laughs> you know, that type of content. You guys know what I'm talking about. But it really is like for the music artists. You see The weekend. We put The weekend's uh, first single, all right, Heartless, on Triller exclusively for one week before he released it on YouTube, before he released it on all his other social. It got over 70 million streams, almost 50 million views i mean 50 million streams actually almost 50 million streams and 70 million plus views okay it broke the song double platinum why because apple music is actually connected to triller so when you listen to a song on triller it counts as an actual record being streamed so if you're an artist think about this on tiktok your music's getting streamed you're not getting paid when you're on triller and you're an artist and you go on our platform and your song's getting played to anyone's video it counts as a stream as long as it's placed for more than 31 seconds. So we have up to 60 seconds license free with all the major record labels, Sony, Warner, Universal, all right? And, 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 and you can play any song as long as it has a Triller filter and the Triller logo and emblem on Instagram, even TikTok, even Facebook, wherever you go, the video won't get taken down because the music rights are cleared. And that's what makes us truly a music industry app and a music industry platform for artists to get their fans and new fans to discover their music because it's so hard right now to discover new music. Where do you find it? Where do you go? When you go to Triller, you're going to be able to see new music from the best rappers, best artists, country singers, you know, uh, dancers from Jabba Walkies to the Kinjas, you know, uh, to comedians. You know, you'll see everyone and anyone. But what's really dope about it is we really cater the experience, cater the technology, cater the tools, everything for you, the creator, to do you. And that's really the difference, I would say, with Triller and the rest. And I know we just went number one in Korea uh, for multiple weeks. Triller was a number one app across all stores, uh, app stores in Korea, which is like super, super, super exciting. Nothing but hats off to Kakao and all our partners out there. But I heard we got beat out by a chicken app. Uh, I don't think I saw this, but uh, I found out there, there was some other random app. I'm like, what is this app, this chicken app that beat Triller? And then my friends in Korea were telling me that it was like some chicken app that was giving like 50% off fried chimek, fried chicken and beer till like September 6th or something like that. But, you know, fine. I'll, I'll take that. I'll take a chicken app that thrown in Triller in Korea. Uh, but with all that being said, I just want to say thank you to, to Moo Conference. Um, I want to say thank you to all of you just listening to this keynote speech. I really believe that the future is music premium content, digital technology distribution, and we're going to see more and more in this space from a collaborative uh, 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 a way of actually making music in the midst of COVID and being in your homes. You're seeing companies like BandLab, uh, uh, Soundstorm on SoundCloud, but there's going to be many more ways to co collaborate. I've been seeing so many music pitches with VR, AR, and other types of virtual uh, uh, ways of interacting with music. So I really believe we're just completely going digital, and we have to accept it. This is 2020. We're not going backwards. Everything else in the past was the past. The world's never going to be the same again. It's not like a year from now we're going to be like, hey, you remember the pandemic? Man, that was really crazy. Nah, dude. This is going to be here for like the next decade or more, meaning whether it's COVID or something else, we have to be prepared as a human race. But it doesn't mean that we can be stopped from making music, entertaining, and getting that music and that entertainment out to as many people as possible. In fact, now that we're in the pandemic, we're going to be able to get it out to more people because it's going to be reaching everyone, everywhere, any place at any time through their mobile phone, through a digital experience, and through this new virtual world that we live in. Thank you very much. My name is Jason Ma. Peace out and come sum it up.